and welcome to the environmental session about which layers you can use to make the species distribution models. Here I am not going to talk about um, big details or specifics about each of the different environmental layers that you can use for calibrating your models, but I am going to stick in um, trying to understand, trying to, to help you to understand the, the big picture here, the broad picture. So I will, I will first talk about uh, which kind of variables they are, and then I will talk about the, the normal problems that you are going to face when you are working with this kind of um, variables. My main intention here is, is um, again, help you to understand where we are and, and ideas that uh, maybe you can use for, for your research. So, let's start here. So, my name is Sara Varela and I am working at the Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin, in Germany, and I am working with uh, species distribution modeling and maybe, uh, mainly I was um, using these uh, techniques to try to understand the distribution of species in the past. So, glacial and interglacial climatic changes and, and the species ranges shifts. So, after doing these kind of things, I was uh, very interested in which kind of layers we have. So I was working with uh, different uh, the outputs of the different Earth system models um, for my research. So I will give you this this. Uh, so this is this is my background, um, and here what I want is trying to help you. Like okay, this is where we are, and and this is what. I think are interesting ideas for you, for your research. So I assume that if you are here in these uh, lessons, it's because you want to map species ranges, because you have an idea, like I want to map uh, this frog and then check if um, there is an overlap with this other frog or what is going to happen, if climate changes, if we are going to have these hotspots of biodiversity, they are going to shift or something like that or where were the refugia of the species in the past. I guess this is, these are the ideas that you have in your mind. <clears throat> and I guess that uh, you know, like, you need to gather species occurrences, you need uh, to download environmental layers, and you also are worried about the algorithms that you might use and the mathematical models that you can use. Um, and with these three main ingredients for mapping a species, I think species occurrence is something like you might have to think about. And also the algorithms, I think, is something like you, you should have... Um, it's something like you... you I am sure you, you thought about this and, and maybe you're even scared about this. But I am not sure how much you... If, if you really thought about the environmental layers and what what are the problems that you're going to face uh, for, for gathering this kind, kind of data. So for the occurrences normally, and this is, you are going to have a whole bunch of sessions about uh, species occurrences, the problem is we're working with a lot of species, a lot of points, and we need to clean the big database. So we have a lot of databases with a lot of points, and for sure they're going to have errors in space, and errors in the taxonomy and a lot of different things. For the models, most of you think they are difficult and most of you think that once you understand the models, then everything is okay. And this is not that true because you also need to think and it's very important and we are going to have six lessons apart from this. Uh, to explain you about the environmental layers. Environmental layers are really time consuming. If you want to add different things and you want to play with environmental layers, and this is going to give an extra value of, um, in your works, you need to, to learn different things and techniques, so it takes time. Okay, so, so for this, um, I, I, I would like to draw your attention like, um, Working with GIS files is not always easy. So, first, 
what is an environmental layer? So I'm going to talk about this and then how to work with environmental layers. So what is an environmental layer? We all know that the species distribution are tightly related to the environment. So we have a feeling like species are here and not there because the climate is like that or the pH of the soils are like that or maybe the salinity is like that. And you can guess that environment is more than climate. It's all the abiotic conditions that are there. So if you think of an olive tree, for instance, you can come up with maybe precipitation is important and temperature, maybe soil is important, altitude, orientation, and you're going to focus on these kind of variables and you are going to try to, to, to find the most accurate vari variables for your study extent, download it and try to use it. But if we work with a seaweed, for instance, maybe you, you need different variables. You would need salinity, maybe water temperature, maybe if there are rocks or not rocks in this coast, the depth, the energy of the waves, different things. So environment is, is, is a mixture of different layers that we can use to try to predict where my species can survive. And for you it's very important to understand which layers are now available to work in biogeography. Because we have, for this kind of landscape for instance, we are going to have layers from remote sensing and layers from models and even models made with remote sensing uh, data. So we have different kind of layers, very broad uh, definition of, of these things and we have the models can be very complex and, and for instance I, I have this image here for you to understand that the, the models that uh, people are using now for predicting the climate in the future and in the past they are very extremely complex and they are three-dimensional layers about um, the atmospheric circulation and oceanic circulation and they have vegetation models and they have soil models they have everything together and they try to see to, to understand how climate is working in the present to predict it into the past or into the future so with all these things we get our climatic simulations and we are going to have one lesson about climatic simulations with Dirk Karger then we are going to have another lesson for you about paleoclimatic simulations with Erin Saupe. Then you are going to have one entire lesson about uh, remote sensing layers with Monica Papes. One lesson about topographic layers with uh, Josep Amatuli. And one lesson of soil layers like pH and everything with Gabriela Sukin. And finally, we're going to talk uh, Hannah uh, Lois Owens is going to talk about marine layers. So with all these things you're going to have a very detailed information about everything that you can you might need for 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 any species like marine species or, or continental species. But once you know about all these layers you're going to face the next step. That is, now I know which layers I need, and I know where to download it. So now, how I work with these environmental layers? So, for in the ideal world, you're going to have like different layers, and they are all the same, and they are perfect, and you have your points that are here, your present points, so you take, you extract the temperature and precipitation of your points, and then you use this temperature and precipitation to make a model, and this model, that is this O that I have here, don't worry, then you project it in, again into the environmental layers, and you're going to have your map. This is the, 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 the broad picture of what you are going to do. Yes, but but for doing this, you need to work with environmental layers that are GIS files. So you need to learn GIS, okay? Or uh, you need to work in R as a GIS software. And then you have a second step that I also want to talk. It's like climatic models, they don't fully agree, okay? 
So let's start with uh, what, what are the problems that you're going to face about uh, opening the, the environmental layers. Well, environmental layers are GIS files, so maybe not everybody here knows and, and how to work with these files. So for you to understand, there are different two main types of uh, GIS files. Um, GIS files are maps, are information georeferenced, and this can be like matrices, like raster files, and this can be like vector files, the shape files. What is a matrix? It's just numbers, so you have pixels with values like it can be temperature, precipitation, whatever you you can think about uh, continuous output, and then you are going to have uh, some text files say, talking about extent, so it's the limits of this uh, map, the resolution, the size of the pixel, maybe the name of the variable, the projection, and which is no data, like there is no value. This has data all around, but maybe imagine there are some other raster files that the ocean has no data. So it will be uh, not, uh, yeah, not a number. Then we have shape files. What is a shape file? A shape file is a vector that can have polygons, like here. This is a soil uh, vector file. Uh, which polygons say that maybe this is uh, I don't know, a rocky substrate, and this is uh, sand, and this is other type of, of uh, soil. And then we have the polygons, and then we have a database with the ID of the polygon and whatever information you want. You can have the name of the soil, you can have the population in this polygon, you can have whatever you might think is interesting for for you and you can work with this and you can do math with this and you can select the polygons based on any uh, thing in this database everything you can think you can do it so what is the main problem when i am trying to help students to make their their uh, environmental um, to work with an environmental data, the first thing is they need to understand is the GIS layers are heterogeneous. They have different formats, they have different resolution, they have different projections, they have different extents. And when you are working and preparing your layers, everything needs to be the same. You need to have the same extent, the same resolution, the same projection, because if not, the layers are not going to match. Generally, in, in what are the main things, like extensions, you have rasters on shape files, the rasters have a lot of different kind of extensions. You can have a raster or TXT or an image or a nasty file or even a net CDF that is um, an array of matrix. Uh, this is the most complex and, and uh, format and maybe the others are much more simple. Once, and you need to understand this to open it. So you need to understand the format to open, depending on the software that you are using. You need to open this with one button or the other of if you are working with R, with a raster package or a map tools package of different packages. Map, map tools is for shape files and raster is for rasters. Once you have your map open and you can see it, the next thing is you need to match these two things. They need to be in the same, same exact position. So you need to understand the extent and crop. Maybe I need to crop this map here to have just Africa, exactly the same. So maybe this is like minus 20 to 80 and minus 40 to 30 or something like that. So you need to crop this map to have exactly the same extent of this one. Then you need to have the same resolution. Imagine that this now is a raster file because I rasterized this, um, this um, soil polygons and make it a raster. This, this also you can do it. Um, so then these two resolutions, the pixels, should be exactly the same. So I need to match both things, okay, to have like resolution 0.5 degrees, for instance. And then the projection, the projection should be exactly the same also. And here you have different projection, projections. If I have, imagine that 
even Africa seems like it's very much the same, but it's not. It's not going to match perfectly. So if you have a Mercator here and Robinson on the map, you have this kind of projection, you need to reproject this, for instance, in Mercator. Or this in the other, whatever, whatever you whatever you you want, but all in the exact same projection. So you have the exact maps in the same places. You can match all your matrices, and you can start uh, working with all your different uh, environmental layers to calibrate your uh, models. For this, as I am saying, I was saying, you can work with. QGIS, with RGIS, with Idrisi, that is a um, GIS software, uh, it's focused on raster layers with grass, uh, or you can work in R. I strongly recommend you to, to work in R, because then you can do everything in R, for instance. And then you have different libraries that you are going to need for working in R as a GIS software. Okay, second thing that I want to say. It is very important if you want to work uh, for making your models um, make a prediction for the future or for the past, like if you want to understand where the species were in the past in the last glacial maximum, or if you want to make your prediction into the future, like what is going to happen with my species because the climate is changing, then you need to understand that the, the Earth system models, the ones that I, I showed you, this, this three-dimensional uh, crazy complex models uh, we have different ones and not uh, the predictions they don't agree they more or less show some trends they basically uh, agree in temperature change but not in the precipitation change here you have like uh, differences and different experiments and don't worry about this this is just they are different and why this is important? Because the same variable, the same exact climatic variable, like annual mean temperature, is going to have different patterns in space. And I told you, more, more, it, you're going to notice this more with precipitation variables. That you can have like 1000 precipitation or 1500 precipitation and something like that. And for places like the Mediterranean, that we have like 400 millimeters of precipitation per year. Changes of 100 millimeters is a lot, or 200 is, is, is going to desert or not. So these kind of small changes are, are very important for, for the biodiversity. So the same climatic variable can show different spatial patterns. And this is very important, why? Because we use the climatic uh, variables to extract the conditions where the species can live. With the framework of the ecological niche models, we are using the environmental variables to extract the conditions where the species can live. This means that I have imagined here, these are two toy examples, don't, don't worry about this. Two annual mean temperatures, this is CCSM and this is, this is working. So we have four points, so this is where my species can live, like, uh, so, sorry, my I sampled the, the species here, and I extract the value and I have this like temperature and precipitation. I have like, this is where my species can live in 30 degrees and in 25 and 100 millimeters and 200 millimeters, something like that. If I use another model, I am going to have a slightly different uh, niche for my species. This is important for you to understand. So, because we are using these variables to quantify the niche of my species, the variables that we are using are very important. And if you have several models for one variable and they don't agree, then maybe you need to add different ones and run like different um, experiments to see the uncertainty because of the variables. If you cannot choose one better model of climate, then you might need to add several ones. If this is for the present, this is not that terrible because more or less all the models are calibrated to, to fit the current values and they, uh, they use satellite images and they use all the data that they can have to fit these models. So more or less for the present, um, for the present simulation, they, they have more or less the same values. The problem is for the future. 
because we need to project our model to make our maps. And we project it, imagine this, this is the, the same example, so we have two models here. It's, they are more or less the same because they, are, they are, were calibrated in the present and then we project it into the past or the future. This is a toy example, don't worry about the maps. But then we are going to see like big differences. And we are going to see big differences if we are adding a lot of precipitation variables because precipitation is the one that is changing the most. I have a, a paper in, in PLOS ONE in 2015 explaining this for the last glacial maximum, so you, you, can, you can read it if you want. Okay, so basically this is the thing. You have the environmental layer, you have your points, you extract uh, the information based on where are your points. So here is 15 degrees, and here is 18 degrees, and here is 20 degrees, and here is 17 degrees, here. Okay, so 20 and 17 and 15 and everything that is here, it goes here. And then I have another layer, there is precipitation, and I am saying uh, here is 200 millimeters, and here is 250, and here is 300, and here is 400, and here I have the same thing. Okay, so Based on your points, you are going to have your niche. And then, based on your points, you are going to construct a model. And then, based on this model, you are going to project this again into the map and see where I have the places that have 17 degrees and 200 milliliters of precipitation. And this has also wait, sorry, like 18 degrees and 250, so they are inside the niche of the species. So basically, with all this in mind, I suggest you to learn how to program. This is very important. Why? Because if you want to add the uncertainty of different climatic models, you need, you need to make the things automatic. Why? Because then if you want to do the same model, I don't know, uh, with uh, different algorithms, like six algorithms, and with six different models, Things get complex. It's 36 uh, times everything that you want to try. And if you do it by hand, you're going to finish very tired. So, so the, the shortcut, even if you don't think that it's a shortcut, is, is, uh, is learning how to program. Uh, you are going to learn slowly, but once you know the basics, then you are going to, to, to be able to, to do things much more quickly. So this is, this is for me, I think, if, if, you, if you are in these lessons, it's because you want to work in biogeography, macroecology, big data, big, um, yeah, large amount of, um, of data with different species. And, and I think that, that the, uh, the, the, the main thing here, or the first thing that you, you need to to, to start it is, is with learning some language to make everything automatic. And here you have an example of, okay, so we have the data, we have the climatic variables and we have like different models, so I have one prediction of this, but this is just with one climatic model, so I am going to do exactly the same with another climatic model and, and I can have 10 climatic models or I can have very different ones. So then I really, I am not going to do this one by one. And then I am need to, to make a summary of all the results to say like, okay, in these areas, uh, all the models predict the species should be present here, but in all these other areas, there is a high uncertainty and some models are saying that the species is here and some models are saying that the species is not here. So I will try to make a map to, to, to understand and to, to help the reader to understand all the results that you, you get with all your simulations. So, again, broad picture and, and what is the workflow and, and time planning for you when you are entering this kind of business. I would suggest you to start with a toy example also, like take GB data, don't clean it, don't worry. Take, for instance, working variables that is very standard Take the maxent default settings, for instance, and, and go through all the steps and make a map. Once you are able to do that, then try to make it a bit 
different and a bit um, more spicy. So try to gather information from more than one database, try to clean this data, try to take more than just one climatic model. Uh, if you are working with plants, add soil, add orientation, topography, slope, add different things. And if you add different things, for sure, you are going, you, you would need to, to pre-process pre these layers. So take your time, make it, make your, your set of variables ready for, make your set of variables ready. And when you have all these, then make the models, try to program everything, not, not do things by hand, and try to test like different kind of um, models and things, and, and then make a nice summary of all the things. This is, this can be a long way if it is the first time, but you're going to be, this is not that complex. So there are a lot of things that you need to understand and you need to learn, but none of these things is crazy, is rocket science, okay? So, so you can do that. The, the only thing is, if it is the first time and you need to learn while you are doing the things, this is going to take time. The second time is going to take less time and the third time is going to take even less time and then you can do things and even you can, you can reuse your own code so things are going to get much more simple um, yeah, with the time. So general, uh, general things for you when you are working with uh, environmental layers, you need to learn GIS. Also, you need to learn R because you might need to add different experiments, um, explore the parameters of different models. So this is very important for you to make things automatic. And even you can use R as a GIS. So you can use different packages, like this one that are here, to make your maps and change it and, 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 and show your predictions. And one, one big uh, thing is, is try to play with the environmental layers. Don't, don't be like, until now we were all doing uh, climatic predictions. Where is my species in the present because of climate? Where is it going to be in the future because of climate change? Or where it was in the past because of glacial cycles. We did that a lot of times and it's getting boring. So, so try to add more things. Try to, try to make things much more interesting. Uh, I think it's much more fun if, if, you can, if you can add new things. And, and everyone has different um, sensitivities and everyone has different uh, goals. So I am sure that uh, for your species, you can think about a uh, yeah, different environmental factor that you might want to use. And even you can construct your own uh, layers. Like, okay, distance to roads, maybe this is important. Or distance to rivers, maybe this is important because it's a species that needs the river for breeding or something like that. And it's not dispersing very well. Whatever you think is interesting for you, you can build it. You can build it with a GIS software and add it into your, your stack of variables that you're going to use to calibrate your model. And the final, my final statement here is that I think that we are just starting to explore, to explore how we can use this big biodiversity data for and understanding the, the spatial distribution of a species. So I feel that almost everything needs to be done still. We were just scratching the surface. We were just playing with climate and with very few climatic models. Now we have much more things. We are going to have uh, climatic models with a high resolution for the future and for the past and even for, for climatic models for understanding the climate of like deep time climatic changes. So all these things are going to, to be ready in the near future and 
is going to be, I don't I think it, this, this, uh, the study of biogeography is just starting. So my, my suggestion is explore, try to learn all these things and try to, to think about your species and try to, to, to take all the information that we are um, trying to explain for your own, uh, yeah, for your own ideas and for, for your own questions. And even uh, for me, just the last thing that I want to say, even um, even if you don't end up doing, I don't know, um, science or you end up working in academia, all the things that you are learning here, they are very important uh, because they, they will allow you to, to enter the markets and, and I think now is very important, these kind of things. Uh, so all the statistics, all the modeling, and all the big data handling on all the spatial stats and everything uh, are going to allow you to, to enter in this data scientist uh, world, for instance. And, and I don't know in different places, but here, at least in Berlin, we, there are a lot of startups and they are really happy to, to hire scientists that have this kind of background. So. I don't think it's a waste of time to for you to learn all these things and and uh, to be more skilled with uh, with this kind of tools. So well, I I hope this uh, lesson will help you. And uh, for in, during the next weeks, we are going to have, as I told you, different. Um, uh, uh, lessons for six different kind of environmental layers, so you are going to have a lot of information of different models and different things and different assumptions and interpolations of weather stations and interpolations of uh, flux towers or different things. Um, and with all these things in mind, think like we are telling you more or less what what uh, our best, and 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 then you, you explore yourself. Okay, well, thank you very much. Ciao.